How are we all doing tonight? Right then, let's see. How am I doing? That's an interesting question. I'm doing well. I am doing well. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 uh, Operation Frankton, aka the Cockle Shell Heroes. And yes, this is tonight's live. It will also be Monday's Long Patrol, which has been recorded. Tomorrow's Long Patrol. Tomorrow's Long Patrol. That will be Key Ships Series 7, Ships 10. Bitrix and Emma. And if you haven't heard of ships called Beatrix or Emma, in terms of warships, don't worry, we'll do tomorrow. Hello, everyone. Yes, I am <coughs> still coughing. Slightly better. Uh, I'm on. Uh, on oh, had an interesting conversation with the doctor, which basically was a case of, okay, here are some more pills, here are some things, and also get some cough mixture. So, um, this stuff apparently. Apart from tasting foul, although it does taste a lot better when it's chased down by and brew. Um, apart from tasting foul, can also make you sleepy. At the moment, it isn't. I have no idea why it's not making me sleepy. I, I, you know, it's not as if I have enough caffeine in my system to counteract anything on that front. If caffeine actually affects me. That's the interesting thing, because caffeine doesn't affect me, so perhaps this won't affect me as well. Interesting question. But, um, yeah. I'm on even more drugs. Yay for me! Hello, everyone. So, hello, Night Secret Front. <coughs> hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, Zusky. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Lizzie Mitchell. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Architect 96. Hello, Carl Gunther Gersberg. Hello, Buggate 8229. Hello, Paul Emmas. Hello, Stafford. Hello, everyone. And, yes, hello, Felix B. I know you can get the Benelin non-drowsy, but honestly, this was what was available in the boots I went to, and so that's what I got. And I'm hoping not to use, have to use it for that long, because it honestly does taste foul. It really does. I asked them for the nice-tasting one, and they said, well, this is nicer than the others. Eh. <sighs> Uh, why no cough drops? Because, honestly, I'm not that big a fan on cough drops. Um, I tend to avoid them. I probably should do that, the go that route, but I, 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 I'm taking enough of these. And other medications as well. But yes, that is why today, this is all a bit of an explanation as to why, at certain points, I might cough. And if I cough, I apologise, but please note. <coughs> the person will be most annoyed by me coughing is not you. It will be me. It will be me. So. How's everyone doing today? Oh, I will also add, I've been having some fun recently with some of the videos. Um, let's see, what was it? Oh yeah, we, 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 some people have been doing some very interesting comments. And I do say this in the nicest way, I'm going to say this in the nicest way, but if you start out, com if people start out comments calling me insane or various other things, okay, I, I, I don't mind a little bit of banter. But my basic premise is that I try and be polite because it's about it's about discussion of history and all those things. If you start out with a comment like that, then it doesn't matter how good your comment might be the rest of it. The temptation for me is to do one of two things. Ignore it, or go full academic on it. It's not good if I go full academic on it. Because I will take the comment apart and I will 
forensically go through and show where you are wrong. And that's the thing. As I explained with the whole discussion of turbines, etc., it's very easy and sort of oh, jets and turbines and the whittle thing, it's very easy for a single academic to go through and find problems and disprove an entire thesis because of those small problems. It's basically, it's an argument structure and we're trained to do that. That's what we basically do. I'm not saying I like to use that skill, I don't, because it's rather nasty when I do, but it's always an option for me. The other option is I ignore it completely. In which case, that's kind of wasted the rest of the comment. Because of some very stupid choice of wordings. Um, just wrong. I agree sanity is sometimes overrated on these thing at scale things, but I would also say that um, if that's your opening line when you're going for an alternate history video, also I would say as well, sometimes with videos, I do find it funny the way people expect me to have answered in two hours every single possible permutation from what could have happened. I would love to say I was that good. But getting that into two hours would require talking incredibly fast. Or not covering anything really. And nice to go everyone. I wouldn't say she renders the world's um, armoured and protectors as obsolete because she's only one ship. She renders the she renders the concept obsolete, but not the ships obsolete. The moment she's launched and commissioned, she renders the concept of the armored cruiser as it then stood obsolete. She doesn't render the ships obsolete. For the ships to be obsolete, you need a lot more battle cruisers in the world. And you always have to be careful about that because people sometimes say, well, for example, HMS Dreadnought. She's one Dreadnought, one ship. Has she really rendered all the pre all the other battleships in the world obsolete by her existence? No. Because they're still better than ever. There are still going to be battleships in there which are better than others. It's just something better than them around. And that's as long as they manage to fight the way they're supposed to fight. Which I would love to say is what the Royal Navy would do, but there again, the Royal Navy invents the battlecruiser concept and actually builds them and then actually uses them in the Battle of Jutland. So, uh, in, in the actual bigger part of the Battle of Jutland. So, um, yeah, there is, there is always a possibility of some stupidity going on. There is always a possibility of some stupidity going on. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the control for the other lights. That's the controller. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, the comments from the alternate history video have been coming in. I've been looking at some of them going, Ooh. I hadn't been planning on doing a comment response video on this topic for that soon, but some of you are sorely tempting me to do so. Oh, as I said, this stuff is supposed to put you to sleep. And lasts for up to eight hours. There. Oh, um... 
<coughs> uh, Dave Harrison, I think you might have spotted the comment I have, yes. Uh, that, that, that was rather a, a fun one. Um, they hadn't invented the reason to need it yet, so they hadn't invented it, so therefore they couldn't invent it. And you sit there and go, no. It's like, for those who are interested, and this is just a, a small thing, which I happen to know off the top of my head anyway because of having seen a very old one many years ago in a factory. Um, the first CNC machines were made in the 40s, and late 40s, and they were used a punch card system to wreck them. And they were made because of the need of making helicopter fan blades. Now, there actually had been machines which were similar to CNC machines before that. All sorts of interesting machines, actually. Um, but they hadn't yet got to what we would consider a CNC machine properly because they hadn't got the added in the punch card system. Think about how punch part cards are being used in the 20s and 30s. If you had the need for it, and especially considering the size of the company which comes up with the solution, it could have been brought up with rather a lot earlier, but that's off topic for today's discussion. Yeah, the common response videos are going to start up again when I'm feeling better and able to do more longer longer recordings around day. Thank you, John Shay. Well, thank you, David Harrison. So. Let's get on with, though, that, you know. Electronic cameras, automatic looms is where they got us this from. Yes, which have been around for a very long time. It, look, it's one of the conceits you have that comes up a lot, and this is going to be actually an interesting the reason I'm actually even talking about this. It also comes in, up in today's topic. Is that a lot of people presume that ideas cannot come up or rather, things cannot exist before they exist. Uh, I, the example I tend to use is Terry Pratchett. Steam engines exist because it's steam engine time. I said to go, well, actually, a lot of things came together, but also, more importantly, funding and interest and need came together. If you consider when steam engines come together, it's also when the need for steam engines comes about. They have ideas, but no one's willing to put in the money, time, and effort to solve that problem, to invest that, and create that solution until there is a need for it. So if you create the need earlier, the solution will probably come about earlier. It might not be the same solution. It might not be as efficient a solution. But it'll come about earlier. Shameless book plug. I do enjoy a shameless book plug. Mainly because, well, I don't know. For those who want to know, these have all arrived now and are going in the in the uh, computer. So hopefully it's going to be even quieter and even more efficient, and the fan noise is going to drop down considerably. I have to admit that not all the fans going in are the brown ones. There is one black. Uh, there is one grey one which has gone in because, honestly, I don't like looking at the brown. But otherwise, they're all good. And that. Very want to play something else. But Shamus Book Plug. Now, I have to admit, the video tomorrow, I'm going to be reading a bit from uh, the, uh, this book. Um, mainly because I needed a decent account of Operation Claymore. And so, that's what I'm doing. Yes, Noctuas. Timmy Lockhart, stop trying to make me laugh. T uh, mechanical calculus were being developed in the 1840s by someone called Bowage. Mm. Mm. 
Right then. Operation Frankton. So here are some stats I want to get to give you. 13 men are assigned to the mission. Of which, 10 managed to go on the mission. Because one of the kayaks breaks. Of those men, 4 make it to the target area. In two kayaks. Of those four, two make it to Spain and get home. In simple terms, you are talking about, of the ten at launch, eight die. Two from, let's just go with hypothermia, trauma of the sea. And the remaining six, 75% of all casualties sustained are killed by Hitler's commando order. They were wearing uniforms. They were carrying out their duties as members of the Royal Marines. And they were shot and killed. After they had been taken prisoner. One of them after he received medical treatment. And the reason. 13. The Royal British. Britain and. Especially the Royal Navy. Because they're all Royal Marines. Had been willing to risk 13 highly trained personnel. To do all this. Was to attack. The blockade runners. It was all to it was to attack blockade run runners sitting in well sitting in off the Garonde. Aye. Aye. If we can uh, we've got not just one. Uh, we have let's see. We have Bordeaux. And the other base attack was Pelm. Two critical harbors. Uh, no. Sinders there is a different operation. Operation Frankton is... Well, Operation Frankton is freaking scary. And it takes place the 7th of December to... 7th to 12th of December, 1942. And it is technically considered a British victory. Technically considered a British victory. I wouldn't say it's failed. Because for the loss of those men, the British sunk two merchant vessels, critical merchant ships, we'll get into that. They damaged two more, so they were out of service for months. Caused minor damage probably to two more. And disrupted major ports and a very critical port facility for Germany's ability to do blockade running. These were not motorized canoes. These were paddle canoes. Paddle kayaks. Folding kayaks. And so that's Operation Frankton quickly. But let's start talking about it properly. So it's rare that I am going to give Lord Louis Mountbatten any credit. 
Um, I'm not saying I'm biased against him. I just think he's incredibly open pro to due to political connections. He starts off World War II as a destroyer flotilla leader, and he's good at that job. He's good at that job. He rapidly rises in the ranks because of connections, because of the need for having someone senior, anyone there. And the fact is, people have died and he looks and sounds right. He has the right connections with the royal family. He has the right connections to the political class. He's got the right connections to be able to use Combined Operations Command is slightly different, though. Combined Operations Command had been set up by an altogether very different kind of character. An altogether incredibly different character. I'm, of course, talking about Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Roger Keyes. Now, Keyes who is, is who I would have picked to go and take command of the Far East. He's who I would have said would have been the perfect Commander-in-Chief Far East to coordinate all the operations of them. Because Keyes is, when he only gets command of the um, combined operations, is probably the most purple commander you ever had. And for those who don't know, purple is the British colour designation for someone who is working tri-service. I.e. working between the three services and trying to get them to work together. Now, Mountbatten inherited an organization which had been built by Keyes. And you can sort of tell the units which Keyes has had a hand in setting up. They often have very innocuous sounding names. They often have very straightforward mottos. And straightforward emphasis. This organization was created to develop amphibious operations from the get-go. But it was built also with the idea of bringing all three services to work together in a way that the sum of what they produce together would be greater than the value of the parts. In this scenario, we are talking about a huge amount of aerial surveillance and information gathering. We are talking about including SOE and various other intelligence organizations to pave the way and organize the extraction. We are talking about the utilization of the Royal Navy to get the people in, the Royal Marines to provide the actual people, and the Army to provide a lot of the training. And, and training spaces used. Now, in this case, everything is put together as quickly as they can do. It's as professional as they can put it together as well. And again, one of the things you have to think about this entire operation, and I will say in Louis Mabon's defense, is that actually he is often the voice of reason. Oh god, that hurts to say, but he is. He was a very good destroyer commander, and I think he was coming into his own in combined operations. He does have some absolutely random ideas, and there's of course Dieppe and various things which are quite rightly held over his head. But, if we consider during this operation, which is one of his first operations, he actually, uh, he actually sort of recommend some very sensible things. So they start off by the proposal was for just three kayaks to be sent. If you consider they were supposed to take six kayaks, five launched, two actually made it to where they were supposed to be. If you consider those odds that one third made it to target when they launched so were planning launching six, if they'd launched three the odds were against him. But he also had to deal with some people who went, well, if we're sending six, why don't we send 12? No. 
It's a difficult thing to work out how many to get right and how many to send. <laughs> now, how do I put this politely? Mount Ban has a habit in many scenarios of jumping in first and of listening to political reasons over sense once. But when the politicians were talking about upping the group to 12, he did say no, we keep it at 6. Because you have to balance the limits of your ability to infiltrate a certain number in. And if you wanted to get more than 6 carks in, it was going to require multiple submarines. <laughs> Or an even bigger, far more, uh, far more, um, <clears throat> uh, the Royal Navy were not prepared to risk it summary. It takes place in 1942. Operation Frankton is, takes place between the 7th and 12th of December, 1942. Now, the whole operation, its whole concept, rests on the ability to supply, surprise the Germans. I will also say this. There are some incredibly rich characters in this. And I'm not talking rich in terms of wealth. I'm talking in terms of personality. I am going to be describing to you two, the two commandos who survived. I'm going to go into get in detail about them. I'm going to be describing certain other persons they met on their journey, and some of other people who were critical on their journey. And I think it's worthwhile listening to them and listening to their descriptions. But I will add that I am going to leave some stuff out because it's included in the Long Patrol, which is going to come out on Monday. And I want you to have a good Long Patrol for New Year's Day, because whilst I know there are going to be some people who are, quite a lot of people who are going to be lucky like me and are going to have lots of time with their families and therefore are going to have lots of or friends and are going to have lots of fun on New Year's Day, there are going to be some people who are going to be alone. And so I want New Year's Day's video to be worthwhile watching. So please note, if you see something, you go, Alex, you haven't inc you haven't covered this in this. Well, the reason probably is because it's going to be in the Long Patrol. I think the point I'm trying to make about Mountbatten is he's over-promoted. Let, let's put it this way. He's a very good flotilla captain, and I could see him... And it, I think it could have been very different if he'd had more chance to get experience. But he basically goes... How do I put this politely? Okay. He goes, in World War Two. From Flotilla Command to Captain of Illustrious while she's in repairs following, uh, following the getting damaged at Malta in August 1941. And in October 1941, he's then made... Com uh, combined Operations Headquarters, Chief of Combined Operations Headquarters, and is made a Commodore. And pretty much from that point onwards, he's going up senior, uh, sort of, not naval commands, more like general commands. Um... It's... Very quickly, he's going into sort of the political sphere. So that's one of the reasons why I have an issue with him eventually becoming First Sea Lord. Because whilst he is made... He is the only, he's one of the few First Sea Lords. In fact, the only one I can really think of. Who has never had a... Ma who never held a major naval command. 
truly, but he reached out. He was made Admiral of the Fleet, and he was made First Sea Lord, and all these things. Be, but his uh, he basically goes from combine operations. To Southeast, a Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia Command, being promoted to Acting Full Admiral. And um, yeah, it, it's it's a classic scenario where he would have he would have been possibly very good if he'd been given actual real commands, appropriate with experience, and tempered up. But instead, he goes. He basically, a uh, while in combined operations, he goes up, rapidly up in ranks. Then he's made a, South, a Supreme Commander, Allied Commander Southeast Asia Theater as an Admiral. And then he's made Viceroy of India and all sorts of things. And eventually he comes back to be First Sea Lord and he does all sorts of weird things as First Sea Lord. It's just... He is very good at, in his role up until he becomes a captain. And then after he's left his flotilla he becomes more and more of a political officer. He's not incompetent, but he's also prone to political flights of fancy and doing things for political reasons rather than necessarily thinking through the strategy of them. And so, as a senior officer, you need to be a bit of both. And that's the problem. He becomes almost too much of a political officer. And yes, you do need that as a bit of an admiral. But I would say, again, he he's uh, he's interesting. He's interesting. Pretty much Paul Amos. I, I'm not. Even, I, it's not even the Peter Principle. It's not even the Peter Principle because it's basically he's friends with Churchill. And Churchill trusts him and promotes him. So. Now, I want to introduce you to something. Now, I have to be quite careful when I do this. Because the SBS have been in existence since 1940. They haven't ever been out of existence. Unlike the British Army with the SAS, who basically decided that in SAS, in 1945, they'd get rid of them. And then 1947, they stood them up again, because they realised two years later that they were valuable. The SBS never disappeared. The Royal Navy at no point went, you know what, we're going to get rid of those really interesting uh, gentlemen over there who can apparently do very interesting things with their guns. Put them down, please. Put them down. Um, <clears throat> yeah. At no point did the Royal Navy ever consider that. And I have various ideas I'll get into about what, in a second while I'll do this. But still, there are other organizations which are folded into the SPS. And one of them is this beautifully named organization, the Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment. Now, let's just consider this. If you consider the level of counterintelligence contr uh, the British are achieving in World War II against the Germans, they could name this group the Royal Marines Assassin School, and the odds are the Germans wouldn't know they exist. But still, the Royal Marines go for a very innocuous sounding name. This is a modern lesson for all of you, all everyone really, when you're looking at modern militaries. Be very careful about assuming the teeth to tail ratio is accurate. Be very careful at assuming the innocuous sounding units, which have such a boring name, no one really takes any notice of them, are what they say on the tin. Always be careful. 99 times out of 100, they are exactly what they say on the tin, they are that boring. But the one in a hundred, Royal Marines Boom Patrol Attachment, people who take kayaks from submarines and go blow stuff up with limpet mines, carrying a pistol and a very sharp knife. Uh, to an extent, Dave Harrison, I think that's that's about um, about um, 
Mount Button, uh, you've said that uh, so career hot house due to wartime, casualty replacement and being the best fit at the time someone came up with a role. Pretty much the best fit to the mind of Winston Churchill when he came up with a role. Um, that's pretty much it's the best fit to the mind of Winston Churchill. Er, there's always other options and other people being suggested, but Winston Churchill likes Mount Button. And that's part of the trouble. At several points, the Royal Navy would like to take Mountbatten and go and give him off a decent, give him a command appropriate with his rank, and let him get some experience. But they don't get given it. He gets promoted by on Churchill's orders and pushed off to another political posting. Which is why, when he comes back as a senior admiral and becomes first sea lord, he's never he's not had a seagoing command since his flotilla. So I finally found my book Raiders on jo of Joff Laffan. Four pages for Frankton. That's not unusual. Frankton is one of those operations which gets forgotten quite a lot. There is actually a movie, The Cockroach Shell Heroes, which is sort of good. Sort of good. But I would personally prefer a movie not be made of this, of this um, particular war effort or a, no a new movie or a new TV series because I think it would be mucked up. So, the Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment. Forerunners of the Special Boat Service, but the Special Boat Service never goes out of existence, so technically the SBS are their own forerunners, but other units get fought into them. One of the problems you're dealing with in terms of disorganisation is very early on, they are getting a lot of experience doing interesting jobs and a lot of training they practice with fast boats they practice with kayaks they practice with all sorts of things and the disturbing thing about them is we know a lot about operation frankton but mostly we know that information because it was considered such a heroic mission and you have to uh, there are sometimes some of these scenarios as I've said before, okay, with the National Archives, less than 2%, well, roughly 2%, actually, it's not that far off 2%, of archive material, of the British government's records survive in the National Archives. 2%. And they create fouls, the bureaucracy is colossal, so in a nice way, that's not still, not that, that's not that bad, because, but you probably wouldn't necessarily want to maintain all the records permanently. But one of the things you do find interesting is that it's very easy to get things hidden beyond 90 years. Just to make sure they're part of the records which are destroyed. And when you look at some operations, some units, for example the Dam Buster Squadron with their dam busting bombs. Yes, a single operation makes sense. Because of their equipment. They do actually do something, a few other interesting things. But because they're using very specialized equipment, that makes sense. But when you think about this, and you think about other things which happened during World War II, this unit could have been used a lot. It might not have been used at all. We know it was used a few times. Paddy Ashdown um, has done a good documentary on Frankdown, uh, Frankton. For what, Paddy Ashdown documentaries. Um, there are also some good books. Yes. Um, Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment. It's, uh... Well, they also, if you think about the name, the other thing about this name is you can acquire whatever you want. We patrol the booms that defend ports. Okay, we'd like some machine guns, we'd like cut rifles, we'd like pistols, we'd like knives, we'd like scuba gear, we'd like limpet mines, we'd like kayaks, we'd like wetsuits. Um, you can't really say no to anything.
exactly common Cameron there are not a lot of there are not a lot of records surviving but they did operate we're fairly sure very heavily in the Greek islands so here is their tool here is what getting them in and this is the thing is one of these actually survives okay one of these actually survives. That's that's just amazing to me that one of them actually survives. A kayak actually survives. And I will say this, okay? If you go and look up the Cockle Mark II canoe, you will notice that I have used a picture from Wikipedia. And there is a reason I've used a picture from Wikipedia, and I have said this in Long Patrol videos, so I'll say this again. It's because the pictures I have of this particular kayak which is in the Combined Military Service Museum in Maldon, Essex. And is actually the kayak which we think was Cachalot, which was was the, the one in the kayak which was damaged on the submarine, so couldn't actually be sent, and then it goes back and gets... It's supposed to get repaired, but it goes back to the place it was created, and just arrives there just after they've actually moved all the work to somewhere else, for all the work on... Uh, the canoes, so it never got repaired, and just got sat there and then got repaired later by volunteers. The reason I haven't used my own picture is because my own picture of this include roughly seven, mm, actually mostly under seven, uh, young people waving at the camera, which for me a picture I was sending to their parents, because I had my little cousins with me. So I forgot to take a picture without them in front of it, so I'm using the wiki picture. I do actually have my own picture of this. I have been to see it. It's worth it. It's a lovely place to go. It's a cool trip if you're in the area. But I can't use any of my pictures from there because they've all got little cousins on them. Algar. Well, dry suits, yes. Wet suits, no. Mm, yeah. Yeah, dry suits, not wet suits. So this is what they're going to see in. And please note, I'm going to read out the official of what each of these carried in them. Okay? Each of them. Kayak load will be two men... They'd each have eight limpet mines, three sets of paddles, in case they lost them, a compass, a depth sounding reel, a repair bag, after all, it is a kayak made of canvas with a flat bottom, and it's 15 foot long, so yeah. Uh, and Theoretically, collapsing it made it able to, be neg uh, to move around inside a submarine's hull. I wouldn't like to be doing that myself, but hey-ho. Um, camouflage net, torch, uh, waterproof watch, fishing line, two hand grenades, rations, water for six days, uh, spanner to activate the mines, and a magnet to hold the kayak against the side of cargo ships whilst they're attaching the mines. Theoretical safe load was 480 pounds, or roughly 220 kilograms. And, of course, the Marines weren't going in unarmed. No, they had a uh, 45 cal 1911 uh, Colt semi-automatic pistol. Because, why not? Let's be honest, it's one of the most reliable weapons you can have if you're doing this kind of operation. And a Fairburn Sykes fighting knife. Yes, these, this was one of the units which managed to get the Fairburn Sykes fighting knife. And, as we all know, that is really not a nice blade to come up against. Um, it was used by the SAS, the Special Service Brigade, the Chindits, the SBS, the Parachute Regiment, and, as said, <laughs> the Royal Marines Boot and Patrol detachment, uh, detachment. Um, the fact is, if you are involved in special operations in the UK... It's still around because um, it's the insignia of 3rd Commando Brigade and 
it's also the Army Special Operations Brigade, I think, also have it, have it in their insignia as well. Yes, they do. Brigade Flash has two of the knives. And officially, the British no longer use it. Officially. Unofficially... Uh, I would never be so strong in my statements as to presume that there are no personnel in the British Armed Forces who might be using them still. Because Sykes' knife is frankly a legend in its own right. In its own right. No Sten, no, but there really wasn't much weight left. Pathfinder Platoon for the 16 Air Assault Brigade, 43 Fleet Protection Commando, 3rd Commander Brigade. Yeah, they're, they're all quite nice sounding units. The Broker Fairburn Applegate knife is the more modern evolution of that knife, and it's great. Yes. Uh, there are some very good fighting knives, and... <sighs> yeah, I, I should probably get that person to uh, do a video at some point about using them. Hello, Stafford. So, these are the kayaks. Let's introduce some of the people. Now, you might notice that there is obviously not a picture of um, Lieutenant Colonel Herbert George Blondie Hasler here. I can't find a decent picture of him that I'm willing to use on this channel. The reality is, though... I would say, before we get into talking about him as a person at the time, I want to consider what he does post-World War II. I want to talk about his legacy, because he has one. He has a legacy. As does the other person I'm going to be talking about. Now, Hasler... He is pretty much critical, and you will have heard of him if anyone here in the chat does sailing. Because he's the guy who invents the first practical stealth steering gear for yachts. And pretty much, I would say 90% of the systems still in use today rely on basically his design. In 1947, he took part in the Royal Ocean Racing Club's Dinard Race, selling the yacht Tresang, and uh, won his class championship. In 1960, he completed in the first Observer single-handed transelastic race from Plymouth, New York. And by the way, this race he came up with, this was the race he had the idea for, and... Whilst there are certain beliefs about a bet with the guy who actually won the race, Sir Francis Chichester, um, that's not really true. What is true is that 50 yachtsmen sent, an sent letters of intent to compete. Five actually started. Hasler sailed one of the smallest yachts in the race. His pride and joy, the Jester, which was a Nordic folk, a folk boat design, but... It was designed with a fully enclosed deck, circular hatches in the cabin top, rather than the conventional cockpit. Um, it was... Uh, he basically had used it as a floating... Well, some say laboratory. I wouldn't say that. A floating workshop, really. To develop his self-steering system. He used a Chinese-style junk rig on the western yacht uh, in order to avoid the physical effort and dangerous deck work required to handle a conventional rig single-handed at the time. And it disallowed all the sail handling to be done from the safety of the central control hatch, and Hasler sailed across the Atlantic and claimed he could sail across the Atlantic without ever having to leave the cabin. 
Anyway, he finished second to Chichester's Gypsy Moth the third, and he took crossed the Atla across the Atlantic in forty eight days. He then returned in 1964 for the second race and finished in 37 days, 22 hours. But he came fifth this time. Hasler, though, after that point, decided not to get involved anymore in the race because, well, it was com becoming very commercialised. In that his view was that all these people were competing for sponsors and they were buying bigger and bigger yachts and... It was entirely to maximise sail power and strength. And they were doing it through sponsorship. Not It wasn't personal sailing capability now. It was who could have the bigger bank balance to get the most heavily engineered, uh, heavily engineered vessel. Oh. And so he sold the Jester to someone called Mike Ritchie. And Jester was actually um, lost in Atlantic Storm during the 1988 All-Star. Richie wasn't lost himself. He survived. Now, the thing is, there are marathon canoe court racing, etc., and series, which are still done in this country to stay, which are named the Hasler series. And you can go and do them. They are, I've got friends who've done them. They are absolutely excellent trip, uh, excellent, excellent races and excellent competitions. It's not what I do. Um, as some of you will know, that my hobby, and this is one of the reasons why my fa why the family are hoping to move down the corner, because it's one of the hobbies I really enjoy doing, if I can, you know, and it's far better for me, I find, than doing a gym, is I like to go kayaking in, at sea. I hop around along the coast in a kayak, quite happily, and my dream is to someday have a nice two-seat kayak that I can take the poodle in, and preferably close enough to the coast that I can stick it on my car, get down to the coast and go out for an afternoon and get home and enjoy myself that way. Take the dog. Always fun to have a dog with you. But in the UK, the Hasler series are big things. They are really cool races and really important to the community. And one of the things you find about all the stuff associated with Hasler is it's all about building a legacy of people being able to prove themselves develop their own confidence, develop their own initiative, develop their own ability to to do things for themselves. It's very good. Now. I'm just going to answer some questions before I get into his wartime career, because they come up. Um, are these the same collapsible kayaks the flotilla, submarine flotilla used to land commanders on Sicily to scope out landing beaches and blow up trains for JZ? Uh Yes, some of them are, but they are some of them are earlier developments, because these are the Mark IIs, and they are Mark Ones, and there are also other things as well. Now, let's get into his pre- experience because you see he joined the Royal Marines in 1932 he leaves them in 1948 he was born in 1914 the youngest son of Lieutenant Arthur Thomas Hasler a Royal Army Medical Corps quartermaster who would die aboard the Transylvania when it torpedoed in the 4th of May 1917 um, his mum Annie, jo Annie uh, Georgina uh, managed to still get her children to go through education and Hasler himself goes to Wellington College where he was a keen sportsman and he's commissioned in 1932 if we consider 1914 to 1932 he's 18 years old when he's commissioned in 1940 so he's been in the service for 8 years he is Fleet Landing Officer in Scarpa Flow. Let's think about that. That's quite senior and quite quick. Even in the times of expansion. 
At this point, he is then sent to Narvik to support the French Foreign Legion in the Norwegian campaign. And here's where things get very interesting. So, I would like everyone to put in the chat, those who are not ears, what is the usual, uh, for being a liaison officer in, let's say, in normal operations, what is the usual sort of level of decoration you'd expect them to get? You know, do you expect them to get any direction at the decoration? Or what do you expect to happen? You know, what will they, will they get a decoration? Won't they? If you have any idea, put it in the chat now. Let's see if anything comes up. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get some more iron brew. <coughs> And remember, this is the 1940s. This is Narvik. This is the operations in Norway. Leslie Mitchell, nothing. Michael Cooch, DSO, D uh, DSC, DSO, maybe. Anything else coming? Poemus, nothing. Yeah. Not a lot. DSC. Um, So, Hasler, for duty, for those duties, he works for the French Foreign Legion. He is given an officer of the Order of the British Empire. He's mentioned in dispatches, and he gets the Croix de Guerre from the French. Now, apparently, apparently. I can't find any details about why he gets these things. In that, he is mentioned as having been very assistant and very helpful to the Legion and worked very hard alongside them to maximize their capabilities and operations with the Royal, Mar with the Royal Navy and the British Army. And, of course, the Royal Marines and maneuver them and maneuver them when necessary. At no point has anyone mentioned why he gets these awards. But he gets the Cross de Gear, mentioned dispatches, and the Officer of the Order of British Empire. Now... Uh, the interesting thing is, the Officer of the Order, Most Excellent um, Order of the British Empire is... Well, it goes MBE, Member of the British Empire, Officer, Commander, Knight Commander, or Dane Commander, and Knight Grand Cost Commander. So, MBE, OB, CBE, etc. Usually, if you're going to get a British Empire award, you would get an MBE, because it would start off, and then you might get an OBE for your next award. He's going straight in as an OBE. Don't take this the wrong way, but the moment I saw that, the moment I read that and looked it up, I was sort of going, there is either something to do with the Norwegian royal family going on, or something else interesting going on, and they are not quite sure what award to give you, but they don't want to give you an award where they have to publish a full citation. And if you think about the way the, MB, the OB, MBE, and all those are cited, they are for services too. So, I, I, my suspicion, and my strong suspicion, and one of the reasons why I think, again, that the SBS survive, whereas the SAS don't, 
is that the Royal Navy has had a history of having specialists for a long time. And if you consider Hasler's promotion speed, his rank, his duties, I have this suspicion that he was a specialist long before he got to the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment. And I have a feeling I don't know what he did. I really can't prove it one way or the other. And I'm sure if you can find actual records, they will be very, very straightforward. And very innocuously worded. There will be a lot of space for you to look into them. But I haven't been able to find them. I have gone looking. And I think it was... Um... Well, I got he's only a captain in the Royal Marines at this point. So... Senior field commander, he's not. That's the thing. You, he leaves the Royal Marines as a lieutenant colonel. He does this operation as a major. In 1940, he is a captain. It's... There's an argument whether he's a senior lieutenant, actually, at one point. So, it's a case of... OBE is technically, yeah, that's technically high. If we consider again, you are quite right. There is a bit of a rank system when they get awarded these awards. Um, but again, Captain in the Royal Marines is a little bit on the low scale for getting it at that period. No, and no de Gaulle, so it's not a medal for putting up with Swinging. And not killing him. Now, after this, at the age of 28 years old, he's the lead planner and commander for not knowing only the Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment, but for Operation Frankton. And please note, he is awarded for this mission at DSO. And there is another debate. They decided not to give him Victoria Cross because the enemy sentries who may have spotted their positions didn't fire on them. Didn't fire. Because the four he got in and didn't get spotted by the enemy, didn't get fired upon, they decided not to give him Victoria Cross. I have to say, when you look at this operation at survivabilities, it's it, it, it's something I would be in conflict about. I can understand it, but the reason they said was it was not in the face of the enemy, as that's required for the uh, for the decoration. I'd say an enemy sentry shining a torch at them probably is in the face of the enemy, but it's a torch, not a gun, going off, and so ah uh, it. I, I can understand it from the point of view you have to keep be strict because once you set the precedent it widens the scope and all sorts of people could end up getting things. But I'd also say in this case it's very hard to demand deny him that. <laughs> if he quietly off the call, then Churchill would have made sure he got a chicked up. If he quietly off the call, Churchill would have probably said, Do you want to marry Princess Elizabeth or Princess Margaret Pick? <laughs> I'm not sure the king would have agreed with it, but Churchill probably would have. Um, I don't know. He has an interesting career. However, I know. Night uh, Zero Front, don't worry. I knew exactly where you were, because as you say, 
There is something pinging away constantly for me at this moment. Now, believe it or not, Hasler is an absolutely pure character who probably deserves an entire biopic in his own right, but we don't know what he did. We just know he gets awards or things. Um, Sparks, he actually writes his own biography. And if you... Please note, like all biographies written a long time after the event, you have to be careful with some of the facts and figures given and dates and times. But the feelings, the emotions, and the broad stroke of the events are pretty dar uh, pretty dang on. Yes, pretty much, Manly Um Yes, you went somewhere that is such a risk of your life that we should give you a D the VC, but you were too good at jobs, so we will not be giving you an award for your bravery because they didn't fire you. Yeah, pretty much. There's always been people whose records don't quite match what you can see from you. It's very rare you get PTSD from office work, and most people record of stuff that you usually don't have. Hmm. So let's see Bill Sparks. Now, before we talk about them, please note, he is motivated purely to get this entire mission by revenge. Okay? He heard there was a dangerous job, or there was potentially dangerous work which would get him at the Germans, and his brother had died aboard HMS Naid. He was out for revenge. But there are some interesting things. He is in the kayak with Hasler, and he gets back. They both arrive in Gibraltar, not too desperately. But Hasler's under urgent orders to get home, so he flies home. Which leaves Sparks there, waiting for orders. They're not sure who he is. So they place him under arrest, because they think he might have been some kind of... Um, Absent without or without leave. And, well, he's goes home on a boat. Gets, arrives in the UK. Decides that, frankly, his, um, his father might be upset. So he, go, he decides to give the military police the slip. Goes and visits his dad. Um, he finds his father, who's been told he was missing in action and possibly dead. Spends two days with him. Has a nice time. Then he reports the Admiralty. Um, is about to be arrested again because they're not sure who this strange man is. So he managed to give them the slip. And then he turns up in Combined Operation Headquarters. Where he's greeted with astonishment. They were about to arrest him, but there are two stories. One is that an officer who had randomly visited the unit recognized his face and said, Oh, don't, don't worry, that's one of our Marines. The other is that it was a Wren personnel officer who had been who'd done the tour of the units and had been checking up on the personnel and doing all their details. And she recognized the name and asked them the questions and went, So you're Boom Patrol? You're this, this, this? You're this officer? And verified him quickly that way. Now, I will tell you this: there are a lot of people who want to tell, who want to go with the more theatrical. That officer recognised the face of this random raw marine, and I love that story, but I don't believe it for one moment. The odds are, in the nicest way, it was the Wren personnel officer. Always put, always put your money on the Wren personnel officer. And so this is this is a character, okay? If you think about this, post this operation, post this going on, he then, you know, um, after this, he, the rest of the war, he managed to do some service in North Africa, service in Italy, service in Burma. Uh, after the war's over, he becomes a bus driver. Then during the Malayan emergency, because he's bored, he becomes a police lieutenant in Malaya. You might as well. And then after that, he becomes a bus inspector. Um, he's married twice. He was survived by a daughter, three sons, and many grandchildren. And, well, he got a Distinguished Service Medal for his entire career of service. So, if we consider that, he gets a DSM when he's done all, his, uh, all he's done. 
There's a really interesting question over what did Hasler do to get an MBE? Uh, no, an OBE. Please excuse me, an OBE. <laughs> oh. Most special. The Chris de Gurr information is blank, apart from saying was part of the rear guard and liaison group of the Legion and others. I know. Given the record of Wrens in Combine Ops, it has to be one of them. I won't be surprised. It's, um, yeah, Wrens, WRNS, Williams, Ron Avis. Sorry, you, put, you wrote Wrens, and that confused me for a second because I was going, I'm sure he's right. Is he right? Well, uh, it just confused me. Anyway. Can an RM officer give a tip to a Ren officer with the bear info? No. And remember, he's Marine. That's one of the interesting things we'll be getting into in this formation because once we get into the, uh, the team sent, you realise how many of them are Marine. And if we consider, in his case, in 1942... In December 1942, he is 20 years old. He's a 20-year-old. I'm already older than Hasler was when he did this operation. And he was the old man in the unit. So, this guy had an interesting career. An interesting career. And again, I can't find a decent picture of him. He only died in 2002. Uh, this is the other thing about Hasler. He died in 1987. At the age of 73. Sparks died in 2002 at the age of 80. I, and Colin Cameron, I don't know why so many Royal Marines and Commandos end up as bus drivers. I, I think, honestly, though, we do sort of, to an extent, miss it, because I, I, I'm not sure, but... I just don't think I'd like to be the person who tried to be annoying to a bus driver who had this guy's experience. <laughs> respect for the bus driver is earned. And if you don't offer respect, they will earn it in your skin. <laughs> um, yeah. No, Sir Richards, Hasler was 28 at the time of this op. Sparks was 20 at the time of this op. Steve Richards, you're conf you're you're confusing the two, or I've confused you with talking about both. Um, and Marina William Sparks was twenty in 1942. He was only born in 1922. Hasler was 28 in 1942. He'd been born in 1914. That's uh, I checked with a French military officer who I'm talking to on another channel. Don't worry, Stephen. It happens. 
My coach, he wasn't just a driver, he became an inspector. Blakey with attitude. Again, can you imagine? Are you going to disagree with this guy? <laughs> no. <sighs> so... And now I have HMS Tuna, and I have another interesting character to introduce you to, because I, I couldn't avoid it. Tuna was almost the one I picked as um, my example for the T-Class boats. I didn't, but I almost did. And the reason I almost picked it was because of Lieutenant Commander Richard Pendergast Rakes, a.k.a. Dick Rakes. Now. I know Richards is on here. And Richards might well. Cha want to. Um, change his identity to. Uh, Rakes after this one. Because frankly. This guy is cool. This guy is. Really cool. He had joined... He was born in 1912. He died in 2005, age 93. He served in the Royal Navy in 1925 to 1946 when he was medically discharged. Now, the thing is, honestly, the Royal Navy were keen enough to keep him around. They would probably work around his medical, his medical problems and give him some posts, but he didn't want to stay in if he couldn't do his active, the active things. Now, Rakes entered Dartmouth at the age of 13 in 1925. Uh, he was chief cadet captain and has awarded what's called the King's Duck. It's actually a pretty cool award. <sighs> and sorry, I got distracted by Melanie's sixty four his post. And he's uh, his first ship he served in as a midshipman was HMS War Sprite. <laughs> uh, that was while she was based in Malta. And while there, he used to have to rise at dawn to exercise Louis Mountbatten's ponies. He was promoted to sub-lieutenant in January 1933. Uh, but he got so fed up with the gunnery course on HMS Excellent in the same year, he decided that he would only serve in small ships without guns because he was fed up with the gunnery course. And so he attended the submarine training at HMS Dolph uh, Dolphin in Gosport that year. He would serve aboard HMS L-22, uh, HMS Clyde, HMS 32, and HMS 7, a river-class vessel, before before the war. He was promoted to lieutenant in 16th March 1935, present at the Fleet Review, and he took part in the Clyde trip, which was HMS Clyde's trip to Mediterranean, Palestine during the Arab general strike and it was actually during the general strike that um, after a couple of hours uh, shunting practice at Haifa station he was put in command of an armoured train and kept the line to Samkra open despite ambushes and derailments on one night he decided to join the Transjordan Frontier Force and rode his horse at full gallop across the country by the light of a burning oil pipeline Somehow this all qualifies him so that by the time he returns to Malta, he's made first lieutenant of HMS 7. He passes his perisher course in 1940 and in September took command of HMS Seawolf. 
Now, when he was sea on Seawolf, he had all sorts of funds. He sighted Turpits and called in Victorious' aircraft because he was too far away to actually get a torpedo. He um, potentially torpedoed a submarine, but we can't really prove it because he heard the repeller noise of U-boat servicing behind him. Fired stern torpedoes. There was an explosion, black smoke, all that, but no wreckage found. So, couldn't prove it. Couldn't prove it. He also does all sorts of other fun operations. In fact, he's one of the Royal Navy's go-to officers when they have a special issue to deal with. We have to do X, Y, or Z. Seawolf is good. Seawolf is useful. Seawolf works. And, well, life gets even more interesting at that point. It really does. Because, and you always have to have fun with, with rakes when he says this, you always have to have fun with rakes. He gets Operation Frankton. And I want to read out, I've read out the full document, yeah, I have to admit, in Long Patrol, but I'm only going to read out part of this document. It was their send decided to the evident delight of the officer commanding the military force to try to disembark closer to the coast and near the RAF's badly laid mines outside the dotted lines to the southward. I don't think those mines could have been laid in a more embarrassing position, as they seem to interfere with every possible plan of action from the very start. This plan quite evidently required extreme accuracy in navigation, even allowing for the rather touching faith of the authorities in the accuracy of the positions given by the Royal Air Force. A faith which I did not share. Further, this plan entailed coming to full buoyancy four miles off the coast and ten miles from the radio direction finding station and doing the whole operation in one, cutting out the approach at low buoyancy. But the most important consideration was were that in that position the boats had a fair tide for extra hour and that our position should be dead accurate. Now... At this point, you're probably thinking he will have stopped making digs about the Royal Air Force. He doesn't. The arena, he carries on. That, I, uh, honestly, there are so many letters from him, the various points discussing the badly laid, embarrassing minefield he found. You get the distinct impression that he is waging a one-man war against the concept of aerial mine laying. <laughs> oh. War Sprite, yes. Um, why does it sound like Royal Marines are the custodians of NATO Great Britain? Uh, they are an interesting organization. Uh, as H. Vernon's point of King Sir, for the chat means you're the best cadet in your class at the UK Dartmouth Naval College. Yep. Yes, they are bright fighters, commander, uh, commanders. I, there are do dozens I know have PhDs and things, and it's just. Uh, I, I, I think they're all uh, a bit interesting at various points. They're all a bit interesting at various points. They have to be. To an extent, uh, now <laughs> in 
<laughs> so this is the guy. So this guy is the submarine which Bond goes in on. Yes, yeah, pretty much. Uh, if you're starting to get the idea that this entire operation is full of the raw, some, the basically the Royal Navy going together and going. So who's the best we have at this? Yeah, that's it. That's basically the Royal Navy going. Who's our best wacky submarine commander in the home fleet? Ah, Rakes, yes. The man who rode the entire way across Jordan in a night. Yes, that's our man. The man who ran armored trains in Palestine. Yes. <laughs> the man who, during a gunnery course, decided to call the, uh, the instructors absolute... Mm. Yeah, that'll do. And... Oh yes, and of course HMS Tuna, which is a T-class boat and is a fairly de is actually big enough to take the um, the Cockles Mark II. Uh, orders that came through for Rake were that a small party of approximately twelve officers and men will be disembarked from the submarine in the vicinity of the mouth of the Grand Estre. The party will be paddled up the Bassin Bordeaux area in Cockles Mark II, where they were carried limp attacks on the blockade runners in the port. His orders continue with the phrase, The party will escape overland to Spain. Now, please note, he protested at that quite voiceforously. He felt that they should not be having to escape overland to Spain. They should come to him. At one point, he was suggesting he would drive up to meet them, but they, no one wanted him to do that. They thought he wouldn't get out of it. Uh, he, he was not keen on the idea. And he signs off his note. He signs off his um, post-operational report with something which I'm, I'm going to repeat word for word. At 2022 20, hours, waved au revoir to a magnificent bunch of black-faced villains with whom it has been a real pleasure to work and withdrew to the south and west. Now, considering this is a man who'd spent most of his report lambasting the Royal Air Force and people for being annoying, when he says there are some people who are actually magnificent to work with, that's a big thing. Yes, pretty much Britain does win most of its wars and battles by the fact that we... Let, let, let me put it this way. Britain can win stand-up battles normally, but we prefer to win battles by sending in our resident eccentrics. Look, I would say point out this again about Mad Jack Churchill, because Malagos brought it up. He might have been called Mac ja Mad Jack Churchill, but he wasn't so mad that, the, uh, that they weren't able to use him. He fitted in with the forces quite happily. <laughs> okay. So, this is the Grande Estre. This is the Garonde Estre. And... Yeah, before you say NCOs win battle, wait till we get to the team structure. Think about this Estre. This is... Oh, this is the nightmare. This is, this is really not a place you want to go into. It's just not. It is roughly, and I am reading off the stats page, which I have up here. I have the lovely stats of the Gironde Estre, just to make sure I'm right. Um, oh, the great thing to have hyperlinks in Word documents, by the way. It really does help things. Uh, so, it's 75 kilometers, that's 47 miles long. Three, between 3 and 12 kilometers, or 2 to 7 miles long wide. It is subject to very strong tidal currents. And when we're talking sort of strong tidal currents, I would say if you're in the UK, you would understand something if I reference the Seven Boar. That's what we're talking about.
This is not a space you want to go up to. But this is also a rather critical port. Bordeaux and the other ports in this estuary are critical because they are on the Atlantic coast of France. And because they're so far in, they are difficult for the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force to get to. Not impossible, but difficult. And there'd be a lot of civilian casualties if they did try to. And the fact is, this is the perfect space for the German blockade runners to come. And so disrupting this port is essential. You disrupt this port, you can win. You disrupt this port, life is good. You can stop a huge amount of critical supplies getting through to Germany. We're not talking a huge volume of supplies overall. But if you can disrupt the blockade runners, you have won a major strategic victory. And I will add, the Bordeaux region is lovely. And by the way, oh good lord, just wait until we get to the whole escape route side of this, because that's going to introduce you to a whole other personality. You think the English men involved in this operation are eccentric. We have not even touched the English women who are named as being involved in this operation so far. That they 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 will take the, that 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 will take the biscuit several times over. Um, this is an essentially difficult operation because this is patrolled the entire way. There are estimated to be thirty. Plus, German vessels patrolling, patrolling this area. There are estimated to be defences established, searchlights established, all sorts of issues. So basically, you are quite literally threading the needle in a haystack in a kayak. No, threading the iron needle in a kayak. You are literally... You are... How do I put this? Uh, that, because that mucked up. Um, you are going to have to spend the entire... As much time as you spend paddling, you are probably going to have to stop paddling on occasions because of... To hide yourself from patrol boats going past. You're going to have to deal with the rise and fall of the tide, the strength of the turrets, uh, currents. It's just... It's going to overwhelm you. Uh, Runon, I know you keep suggesting the backyard, a uh, back garden shed for a Patreon topic, and honestly, the reason I've been, av to extent, um, avoiding that topic is because it's quite so massive. Honestly, it's trying to work out which area that the the amount of back garden shed and random things the British have come up with, and also, some people have very large sheds. Very, very large sheds and very large ideas. Technically, Turbina is come, comes is built in a shed. Technically, and that's what gives the Royal Navy turbines. Oh, it is. It, it's got. It's. <laughs> and a low, a low sketch. Oh, good lord. Uh, yeah, they, they, it's going to be fun all them. So, the whole point is the Giron Estuary is an absolute nightmare target, but it's also a very critical target. This is why Britain is prepared to risk all it's doing. This is why Britain is prepared to take 12 very trained, very motivated, very skilled personnel. And Frodo a mission, which is likely to get 
them in trouble. So, yeah. So, yes, high risk, high reward, and frankly low cost. This is the formation you're talking about. Now, please note, I kept I talked to you about Hasler and Marine Bill Sparks in Kayak Catfish. Those are the two who survived going on the operation. Marines Ellery, Fisher, and Collie don't go on the operation because Collie isn't needed because none of them get ill before they go. And Ellery and Fisher's kayak cashlot is the one which is damaged, so they don't go. Corporal Albert Lavier, Marine William Mills in Crayfish, Corporal George Sherd and Marine David Moffat in Kayak Conga. B Division's leader, Lieutenant John Mackinson and Marine James Conway in Kayak Cuttlefish. Sergeant Samuel Wallace and Marine Robert Ewart in Kayak Colfish. Those eight men all die in this operation. All eight of them die. Now, originally, they were supposed to be let go further out to sea. But as you can guess from what I already read out earlier from uh, Rake's little uh, report, he decided not to let them go out further to sea. He put them in closer to sea, closer to the shore. And they sailed from Hollylock in Scotland... With six, with the kayaks and the raiders on board, in on the 30th of November 1942, they reached where they wanted to dispatch people on the 7th of December 1942. And cash lot is damaged while being passed out of submarine hatch. That's what we officially write it up as. Um, so that's why they go with just five. And that's why Collie, Ellery, and Fisher are left behind on the submarine. Now, there's a whole argument as to when or not they go off, whether it's 1936 hours or 2022 hours. Um, I'm going to go with, and this is going to sound very egotistical but if i'm gonna go with anyone of the timing they get off i'm gonna go with the, the person who's actually in charge and watch them go now all boats uh, rakes writes that all boats were on the upper deck by 1945 hours and the first boat was in slings searchlight suddenly it went during the first boat launching they had searchlights um sweeping the area but they managed to not miss them. And he says the last boat was waterborne at 2020 hours, and he waves them over at 2022 hours. Now, considering he reckoned it was going to take 35 to 45 minutes to launch the boats, I would say if he says they go at 2022 hours, that's probably correct. Because, again, Rakes is in the position to know. So while some people say they left at 7.30, I don't think they did. I think they possibly started the process of, of getting the boats up out of the hatches and assembling them and launching them at 7.30. I don't think they'd left before 2022. I just don't think they did. Now, the first thing that happens is coalfish disappears. Within a few minutes, they are encountering 
uh, waves which are five foot high. These are 15 foot kayaks, folded kayaks made of canvas, loaded with stuff, uh, stuff and they're encountering waves which are five foot plus high. Think about that. Think about how high you are in the water. Think about the darkness. Recon was mostly aerial recon and special operations, not any personal recon. Hi, DG40. The uh, four kayaks other than coalfish. So that is catfish, crayfish, conger, and cuttlefish kept going. But then conger capsized and had to be scuttled. It was damaged itself. And so Sherd and Moffat held on to the remaining kayaks in that group. The remaining kayaks got them as close to shore as possible and then they tried to swim ashore. Now, I I normally, I wasn't sure whether to cover this at the end, but I think I'll just sort of mention this now. Um, Shirt and Moffat don't drown. They do actually make it to shore. It shows the strength of their training and the strength of them. Moffat's body is found on the Ilderan uh, on the 14th of December. And Sherd's body is believed to have been recovered and buried elsewhere up the coastline. But we're not really sure where that is. So those two have gone already. They're not dead at this point. But let's be honest, they're swimming through the North Atlantic to the French coast... They're doused in water, and they've got no one waiting for them. It's cold, it's winter, it's not good. Their chances of survival in that scenario were very, very low, but they couldn't keep with the kayaks because they just slowed them down. Richards, have you ever been in a kayak in five foot waves? Yeah, and it's, as said, I it's one of my hobbies, and one of the things I love doing is ocean kayaking. And I have been caught because you can, because uh, sometimes going around the Cornish coast, the waves and wind can change very quickly. And I was lucky. I was younger. I was with an experienced instructor, though, guide who was gu guiding us. We were part of a, a group kayaking session. I was tail end Charlie, and um, we kept together. We managed to get into the beach. We managed to get to safety. We weren't that far out to sea. We weren't as far out as they were. And yeah, a fair number of the rest of the group was being sick. I wasn't, but that might have been because I was running entirely on Iron Brew. So, you know, I didn't have anything to be sick with. They had the kayaks they did because those could fit in the submarines. 20 trucks a day. That's it. They they had the kayaks there because these ones could fit in the submarine. Now, it's not finished by a long shot, the approach. As they got to shore, they actually managed to meet up with Coalfish. I'd like you to think about that. Coalfish's crew have been entirely alone for hours. Sergeant Samuel Wallace, Marine Robert Ewart, had been alone for hours. Struggling. No one else had been around them, and they'd still kept going. They, as for all they knew was they were the only boat left. The others could all have gone, and they were still continuing on their mission, still going through with it, still getting on there. So 
So these four remaining kayaks, catfish, crayfish, cuttlefish, coalfish. The four fish kayaks. Still going. They managed to find somewhere to lie up and get rest for the day. But... Cuttlefish, that's McKinnon and Conway, Tenant McKinnon and Marine James Conway, are separated from the other kayaks. They're separated from the other three. And they reach shore. Their kayak is damaged, so they're having to do, try and do things, uh, to try and get away. And McKinnon and Conway managed to evade capture for four days. Four days. But I think this 11th of December, they're betrayed, arrested by the gendarmerie. The gendarmerie. Not the Gestapo, the gendarmerie. And handed over to the Germans at Le Riel. This, was, this is position is roughly 48 kilometers, 30 miles to the southeast of Bordeaux. And they were attempting to make their way to the Spanish border. So they... Had pretty much damaged their kayak to the point at which they couldn't continue the operation. And they were attempting to escape so they could get back home. What's even... What happens also during that first night is that... Um, Wallace and Ewart of Coalfish... I think that is the last remaining one from B Division. Coalfish. Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart. Those two who'd been on their own for hours all that night, struggling to get to shore, who'd met up with everyone, who were now feeling strong. Um, while they're hiding during the day, they are captured at daybreak near the Pointe de Grave Lighthouse where they'd come to shore, unbeknownst to the other two crews. So by this point, it is the 8th of December, and you are down to just catfish and crayfish already. You have launched with six kayaks. You are down to two. They managed to keep kayaking and they managed to get 22 miles in six hours. Third night, they paddle 15 miles in roughly the same amount of time. On the night for the 10th, 11th of December, because the strong ed tide, the tide had got to reach its summit's strongest point, they managed to only cover nine miles in that same time. So if you think about that, the tide's been strengthening as they've been going. They managed to do 15 miles the first night. Then it goes down to nine miles. Uh, you know, they managed to do um, 22 miles on the, uh, the 9th of December. Then it goes down to 15 miles. Then it goes down to nine miles. The tide has got that stronger. They are distance they're carrying, uh, covering is less than half of what it, were, it was the first night. And this is why the plan gets delayed. Because originally they were going to carry out the attack on the 10th of December. But he decides to hide. And carried out, or Hazel decides to hide and carry out on the 11th and 12th of December. So they took a day to prepare their equipment, get Olympic mines ready to go, and. Decide what they were going to do. Originally, it had been going to be western side of the dock, eastern side of the dock. But now you're down to just two. These two from A Division. Catfish and Crayfish. So Catfish gets the western side of the dock. And Crayfish gets the eastern side.
And well, now it's go time. Now it's go time. And this is where things get even more interesting. They Hasler and Sparks starting at roughly nine o'clock in the evening, twenty one hundred hours, and they went for December. Managed to place eight limpet mines on four vessels, including a spare breaker. Now, if you don't know what a spare breaker is, it's a minesweeper. And it's basically a merchant vessel which has been adapted to be a minesweeper by reinforcing its hull. It's got a very thick hull. It's probably the most, the worst vessel to try and attach limpet mines to because it's got hulls which are designed to actually be hit in mines. Uh, you, there's an old joke that every ship can be a minesweeper once. Well, these ships are designed to actually be a minesweeper by that methodology. They're designed to go in front of ships through channels and set off mines by actually hitting them. Yeah. It, no, 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 it's just not. It's just not why they have it. And it's just, yeah, it's probably the worst thing to do. But also, it's this vessel, the, uh, the uh, spare breaker. And by the way, we don't have a picture of the actual one that, that was there, but we, this is a generic spare breaker. Um, one of the sentries spotting something. Shone his torch down on the water, but didn't see the kayak in the darkness. They were going around the harbour for roughly three, four hours, because they don't leave till roughly 1am in the morning. They start at 900, 2100 hours, they leave at one a, uh, roughly 1am. So it's pretty much four hours, actually, isn't it? Yeah, that's roughly four hours they're doing this. It still doesn't amuse me that the time of the limpet mine is a dissolving antacid ball. It works, okay? It works. Now, at the same time as Hazler and Sparks were doing this in crayfish, Lavra uh, in, in catfish, Lavra Mills in... Why are they all crayfish cat... I'm actually trying to make my life... A, it, this, is, this is annoying for a dyslexic to deal with. My notes aren't always helpful, is it? Because they have them all listed down. I, I, got a, I should have put more spaces between the next hexes. Okay. Lava and Mills, of course, to the eastern side. They don't find any targets. So they decide to go to the Bassins. The ship, uh, you know, the Bassins area. Which is... How do I put this? It, it's, it's not far... From, um, it's not far from Bordeaux, but it's slightly further down away from Bordeaux. And there they find two vessels, and they put five limpet mines on a large cargo ship, and three on a small liner. Just imagine that. Five limpet mines on a cargo ship and three on a small liner. Imagine what happens next. Before we get into that, we're going to sort of discuss what happens next. The uh, two kayaks actually meet at Il Kazu. They just randomly meet up with each other and just go, Oh, we've met up with you. Um, and they actually sail with each other till about 0600 hours, where... Officially, it's near St. John's the Blaine, but I think it's slightly further downriver than that. Well, upriver than that. We'll leave that to one side. And then the two crews set out separately for the Spanish border. After two days, Lava and Mills are apprehended at uh, Montilla Lagarde by the gendarmerie and handed over to the Germans.
Now, let's talk about the ships which were damaged. So what happens? Six ships are damaged. If you're listening to the targets, four had roughly two limpet mines attached to each of them. And two had five and uh, one had five and one had three mines attached. So try and work out which one is which. The blockade on the Tanafels listed heavily and sank quite quickly. The rear of the freighter Dresden um, has her superstructure and propeller shaft severed, sinks to the bottom almost immediately. The cargo ship Alabama has five limpets go off and is hauled severely and damaged. The cargo ship Portland is also hauled and fire causes heavy internal damage. The Tanafels is no longer seaworthy and is used as a block ship in the Griond, actually. That's basically what she's good for. Alabama and Portland with divers are helpful in supporting her. Uh, the spray, a spare breaker and a tanker called the Python. We're not quite sure what the damage was done to them. But we do know, I think some was done, but we're just not sure how much and what. The Germans were very keen to cover that up. The thing was, this caused chaos in Basson and Bordeaux. Absolute chaos. And it kept them busy for hours. Days. It caused problems. If you think about it, when you have a ship like the Dresden sink in harbour, as she did, that blocks up your harbour. You have to remove it. You have to sort out. Same with all the other ships. You can't do anything with their spaces while those ships are there damaged. And once you get away, you don't have to repair them, which takes up resources and time. And all this causes disruption to the flow of supplies. So this causes a massive issue for the Germans. It's not something that's insurmountable. It's not something they can't get round. I'm not saying this wrecks single-handedly the entire program of the Germans in terms of getting supplies in by this methodology. But it does cause some trouble. It's a, it's an interesting time. And this is the point at which, in this whole thing, I start to get annoyed. I'm not going to get annoyed about this bit. But the next slide I get really annoyed on, and really testy. So, I'm now going to introduce you to a character who... If she was in a movie, would probably be played by... Well, I'm not sure who. Because there's a real problem. You would either have them try and have her played by someone who's about 20 years old, so she would look absolutely spectacular. And the reality is, in 1942, she's 47 years old. She's called Gertrude Mary Lindell, Comtesse de Millevelle, uh, co-name Marie Claire, and Comtesse de Montsey. She'd been a nurse in World War I. She was English. And she was a member of the French Resistance from the very beginning in World War II. She founded, led, and when I said led, really led and operated in an escape and evasion organization which was called the Mary Claire Line. Which got Allied airmen and soldiers to, uh, for, uh, to manage to escape from France through Spain. During the course of the war, she was run over by a car 
shot in the head, imprisoned twice, sent, captured, sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp in Nazi Germany, of course. Uh, her son Morris was captured and tortured. Her son Octav Oki um, was captured, uh, disappeared, and presumably died. And when we say presumably died, there is a debate as to whether he died in a concentration camp, died before he reached the concentration camp, or was sent elsewhere to work to death. We're not quite 100% sure. We know he doesn't come back after the end of World War II, and we know we never found his body. I would say she also received a level of criticism from uh, some of her former compatriots in the SOE organization and the resistance in France. Most of those compatriots were people who, how do I put this, who critiqued her, people who joined the resistance a lot later than her. And some of them even accused her of being a, a, a double agent. But I, I agree with Peter Hall. She certainly wasn't. Peter Hall has written an autobiography of her, I think. Uh, He's either not or he's an expert on that, but he, he, I know he talks about her a lot. Um, yes. Peter Hall published a biography of her, Lindell's List, in 2016. All about her saving British and American women at Ravensbrook. And yes, while she was at Ravensbrook, she did actually she managed to get some people out of the thing. Um, she helped roughly 100 Allied airmen escape from France. Uh, she managed to get 47 American and British women re to uh, release the Swedish Red Cross in the closing days of World War II. And by the way, how she used to pick up people when they arrived was she would wear her Red Cross nursing uniform and stand on the station and get them out that way as her patients. She is so cool. And her awards, she got the Croix de Guerre in both World War One and World War Two. She got the Order of the British Empire and the Medal of the Freedom from the United States. She, a biography was written by um, my well, biography was written by a person. Yeah, she wrote. He wrote. Oh, I think I said biography, didn't I? No, oh, I said autobiography. I apologise. <sighs> Did anyone, Mark Morrison, did anyone do a movie on this operation? There has been one, but it's Cockleshell Heroes. It's good, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. He just slapped me for getting it wrong. That's terrible. Anyway, so this woman is something special. Now, when it comes to Operation Frankton and getting the people out. In October, she went to London in July 1942, where she got training from MI9 and various other organizations, and then returns to France via Western Lysander in October 1942. If you haven't even seen Western Lysander, they're very cool aircraft, and they might be another key aircraft coming up. Uh, she set up operations um, for the Marie Claire line again once she returned. However, in December 1942, she's injured, nearly dies in the car accident when a car crashed into the bicycle she was riding. Hence, she was ill, bandaged up, and her arm in a sling... She went and got uh, got and secured Herbert Hasler and Bill Sparks. It 
caused all sorts of humour and fun for the people who, especially for Sparks, who watches very senior, very experienced officer taking orders from this lady who was, left them in no doubts that she was the governor, who was... How do I put this? Completely, you know, indisposed. And yet she gets them there. She manages to, to get them. She picks them up in Rufek on the 18th of December 1942. That's 160 kilometers, 100 miles from where they beached their kayak. And she takes them from the Hotel de la Torque Blanche. Uh, to a local farm. They're there for 18 days. And after they've been there for 18 days, she's managed to arrange for them to be guided on foot across the Pyrenees into Spain and safety. She socially outranks him. She is something. Um... It's it's an interesting bit of a story. They managed to get through, and honestly, that Hasler and Sparks made it is down to, I would say, luck. But also, think about the two characters you're dealing with. Hasler, we have no idea about some of his parts of experience, but he does seem to be very innovative and thinking through, and he comes up with a lot of ideas of how to move and do all sorts of things. And is experienced. And as we talk, mentioned with Sparks, he gave not just one set of military police, this, uh, this, uh, uh, managed to um, disappear from not just one set of military police, but two sets. In very quick succession. He's a, he's a capable character. But I've already discussed Sparks and Hasler and what happens to them. They get home. Hasler, of course, flies home from Gibraltar. Fine. Sparks has his his interesting trip. Uh, they get through Spain fairly easily without any trouble. And then we have the rest. So, I am not going to spend too much time covering these exact German orders, because frankly, I, 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 I don't. It's just... No, it's, just, it's, it's one of those scenarios where I just find it absolutely absurd. I do not like what they did at all. And I will say this, I, it's one of those scenarios where even on 720 it's not great, on HD it does sort of work, and full screen for you to list them, but that's, I didn't want to make this a multi-slide discussion. So, so. Hay Convention 1907, Article 23. To, in addition to the prohibitions provided by special conventions, it is especially forbid forbidden to kill or wound an enemy who, having laid down his arms or having no longer means of defence, has surrendered at discretion, to declare that no quarter will be given. And Article 4 of the 1929 Convention. Detaining power is required to provide for maintenance of prisoners of war its charge. Differences of treatment between prisoners are permissible only if such differences are based upon a military rank, the state of physical or mental health, professional liabilities, or the sex of those who benefit from them. Uh, 
And Article 5. Every prisoner of war is required to declare, if he's interrogated on subject, his true names and rank, or his regimental number. If he infringes this rule, he exposes himself to a restriction of the privileges accorded to prisoners of his category. No pressure shall be executed, exerted on prisoners to obtain information regarding the situation in their armed forces or their country. Prisoners who refuse to re uh, reply may not be threatened, insulted, or exposed to unpleasantness or disadvantages of any kind whatsoever. If by reason of, phys of his physical or mental condition, a prisoner is incapable of, incapable of stating his identity, he shall be handed over to the medical service. And in this, on this, we contrast it with the commander order from the Führer. From now on, all men operating against German troops in the so-called commando raids in Europe or in Africa are to be annihilated to the last man. This is to be carried out whether they be soldiers in uniform or saboteurs, with or without arms, and whether fighting or seeking to escape. It is equally immaterial whether they come into action from ships and aircraft or whether they land by parachute. Even if these individuals on discovery make obvious their intention of giving themselves up as prisoners, no pardon is on any account to be given. On this matter, a report is to be made on each case to headquarters for the information of higher command. So, you can guess what I'm about to start talking about. Uh, menacing for basically that means if you uh, capture female prisoners, you have to treat them differently than male prisoners. So you have to, you know, male or female, you have to provision according to their gender, what they, uh, their sex, biological sex, what they need, sort of things at the time. So basically, you do not start, you don't, don't put all male and female prisoners in the same place together. You don't put them all in one thing. You divide them up like you do prisons. And you have to make certain accommodations. Yes, that is true. But still, I say everyone... <sighs> The thing is about this, and I'm before I get into most of it all, I'm going to point out that um, uh, Raider writes that the executions of captured Royal Marines uh, was something new in international law. Um, I'm reading from a translation I have copied here from Bird's book about Eric Raider. Uh, since the soldiers were wearing uniforms. The fact is, every officer in the German armed forces knows this is wrong. This commando order isn't just... How do I put this politely? There are scenarios where you can say, oh, it's a small group, it's, it's only this group, it's only that group, it's only these people, that people. Uh, it's not everyone. It's not all Germans. The rules of war are taught to all officers. These conventions are known to all officers. They know this order contravenes it. If they follow it through... And remember, there is the rule that an, a, a rule in armed forces that an unjust order is no order. That's been around for a long time. You're not supposed to follow the, all, these, all these orders. There is such a thing as an un unlawful order, and you don't follow it. This is not a lawful order. And yes, you can argue dictatorship, da 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 da. But they're not supposed to do this. And they know they're not.
Wallace and Ewart only revealed the information they were supposed to during their interrogation. And they're executed on the 11th of December. We're not sure where. We know we think it was in a sand pit north or in a wood north of Bordeaux, but not at the Chateau Magnol, um, Black Fort, as is often put forward by some ideas. But the reason we know that is because of some of the books which, you know, have been available. Again, uh, Quentin Reese's book, Cockle Shell Heroes, The Final Witness, is a very good source for this one. And I would say that the reason we know it, that it wasn't there is that there was a German officer, German officer who was at the execution stated it wasn't at the chateau. Lieutenant McKinnon was admitted to a hospital for treatment of an affected need, so someone was following the rules of law. But then Laver, Mills, McKinnon and Conway were disappear off and are executed as well. So someone had seen this order because this order is widely distributed and decided not to follow it. Someone sent McKinnon to hospital. They followed the rules of war. And then someone else decided to actively not follow the rules of war, go pick him up from hospital, organise the others, and all of them were possibly executed at the same location as Wallace and Ewart, but we don't know. We don't know when. We know they were executed. And I agree, Richards, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, but... Honestly? It's a tough situation, I can see that for the German officers involved. But I would honestly be tempted to put them in a boat. With a radio and tell them to bog off rather than do this. Because the thing is, I have to look at myself in the morning. And it's easy for me to say because, you know, my mother and sister would probably expect me to do the same thing and I don't have small kids, etc. Depending. But the thing is. It's not supposed to be on junior officers to resist this kind of order. When some people write when that when you know some people seem to believe honestly that when Radar writes that you know he is having a bad conscience. It's not a bad conscience. That's a man excusing his conscience. It's making fun of it in a way. I. Raider is better than some of the German admirals in so many ways and does resist. But this order, this the commander order is something which should have been resisted at all levels. It flies so much against the rules of war. And I know, I know people go, well, war doesn't have rules, you shouldn't expect it to. No, you shouldn't. But the trouble is, once you've got nation states behaving like non-state actors and not following through the rules, then it's very difficult to hold anyone else to it. And the trouble is, nation states can be far nastier. Nation states can always be far nastier. And the thing is, once you go down that route, you don't hold any nation states to those rules. So you either hold all of them to it, or none of them to it. It's the core army, army group commanders who are supposed to be standing up to this order. And yeah, I'm sorry, that order... 
That's on the whole armed forces. That's on every single senior officer. That's on every single officer who ever let it happen in front of nearby them. Even if they weren't involved, they let it happen. They knew it was going you know it's going on. Laws of war are established through the Geneva Convention, through all these various things, because you have to establish some standards. Not to try and humanize war. You can't humanize something which is, at its very, pa a very basic point, dehumanizing. But to try and limit the long-term impact of its worst excesses. Because once you start this route, let's say the Germans go that route. If the Allies had copied them and said that from now on every German officer captured is going to be executed, no quarter will be given to the Germans, how's that going to affect the war? It's going to make it massively longer term. It's going to make surrender impossible, so they're going to fight to the death anyway, which means it's going to cost you more lives. The whole point of establishing these rules for safe conduct and protection of prisoners was to make war less deadly for you think like lose people administrating the system yes there are lots of ways you could If enough officers had wanted to resist it, they could have found ways to resist without it even being visible. Oh yeah, they all died in combat. Who are those? Oh, they're prisoners from prior to the war. They were captured at Dunkirk. Or alternatively, you drop them off at the Spanish border. Give yourself a 24-hour pass, stick them in the truck, tell them to shut up, drop them off at the Spanish border and tell them to bog off. That certainly takes a little bit more of an active approach than most probably would be comfortable with, but, you know, is it better to do that than to kill them in cold blood? I loathe the myth of the clean work act. I loathe the myth of the clean uh, anything in German forces, really. The, the, the German Navy, as I agree with um, Drachenfeld, due to the, the sheer time it takes to become senior officers in the German Navy, is to an extent there, but after this order they're not. So, for example, if we're talking about the Grass Bay, Battle River Plate. Yeah. No. We're talking about Hans Langdorf. He dies in 1939. You never got to see what his reaction to this order would have been. But considering how he was so fastidious about treating prisoners aboard his ship and how focused he was on their care and keeping them alive and fine and following the rules of war, I can't imagine Hans Langdorf going along with this kind of idea.
and that's that's the other problem. And this is a this is a scenario which you have to deal with with the, in dictatorships more often than not. Is dictatorships don't just lack the uh, don't just affect they affect everyone. There is no they they take the moral out of the moral core out of everyone. Because if you think about it, the army doesn't resist. They, they, people talk about the bomb plots against them, etc. And you sort of go, well, if the army seriously was this silent majority who didn't like the orders, when this commander order comes out, that literally stands in the face of the rules of war. If the entire army turns around and goes, no, we're not doing that, it probably starts a civil war in Germany in the middle, in the middle of World War Two. But we'll leave that to one side. Mm. Oh, that's honestly for water stock. Uh, one of the things I, I will say again before we get into sort of to get into problem summary is I, I do know what you're saying, Frank Bowman, but just remember the two nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They are absolutely devastating weapons, and because they're a single bomb, they really are scary. But have a look at what was done to Dresden and what was done to Tokyo. With firebombing. So, the question is always, was this operation worth it? Was it worth it? I would say it was. The operated the war was worth it. You know, disrupting the trade is certainly worth it. But I'd also say this, the order goes through command order in October 1942. So here's the really brave thing about those those commandos. British intelligence picked up on it pretty much straight away. It was not hidden. I often wonder if it was uh, the British thought it might at first just be a sort of phantom deterrence for the commando raids to try and sap the morale of the commandos. actually made them even more obsessed with not leaving anyone behind and doing maximum damage. We'll lead up to one side. What happened, what this means is that the people going in in Operation Frankton knew. They knew if they were found once they were ashore, they were dead. They knew if they were captured during the operation, they were dead. They knew anything less than complete success, they were dead. And they still went. And whenever I say that in a lecture, whenever I think that, I think back to Sergeant Samuel Wallace and Marine Robert Ewart in Coalfish. Because on that first night, in their kayak, separated from everyone else, they kept going. When everyone else might have been dead and they might have been the only kayak left, they kept going. And so this lovely note, this summary provided by... Mountbatten. Well, 
It has an interesting line in it. A very interesting line. This brilliant little operation carried through with great determination and courage is a good example of the successful use of limpeteers. McKinnon was reported as a prisoner of war. He was reported as a prisoner of war because he was taken for medical attention. So he'd actually been reported as a prisoner of war and then he dies. The rest disappear completely. They never show. They find, they get one bo a report of one body being found dead. To me, to me, I honestly can't describe which is worse. Going and taking someone out of a hospital where they're receiving medical attention. To kill them. Under this scenario. They're in uniform. They're in uniform. They were, they were there as professionals in uniform. They weren't spies. They weren't saboteurs, they were in uniform. That's an important distinction. Once you're in uniform and you're fighting in uniform, there are certain protections according to your Geneva Convention, which is one of the reasons also protects the Germans. And that's another reason why I really, really hate this order. And I really, as said, at this point, this is where my... Any attempt people have to tell me that... The German army and the German armed forces were not were separate from the Nazis and should be treated as separate. Drops completely after this order. You can make a case for it prior to this order, but the moment this order is in place and people start actually enforcing it and actually carrying it through, it's gone because they're breaking the rules of war, because they're breaking going against their training, because they're going against what they're supposed to do, and there is no justification for that because. Here is the ultimate reason why you don't do it. Because if you do it, then prior to their prisoners, so the prisoners you take of once of the, the other side, they have justification theoretically to do it back to you. And you have to hope they're better people than you, because otherwise it's your mates, your friends, who are going to get the, that treatment. So, here we go. That is Operation Frankton. That is the other 7th of December nine, uh, raid on a harbour. And, yeah. It's about as disparate as... Any other scenario. But it's still worth remembering. So, any questions? And yes, I will sort of be doing roughly. Let's see, another twenty twenty-five minutes. Let's go. Let's go for three hours. Do some questions. Chat away. Um. Then I'm gonna probably call it a night, because uh, <clears throat> I'm so far being lucky with coughing wise. But I think taking off to the taking off tomorrow before Sunday's live is probably sensible.
Um, that's about something that's surprising. What was it about the superimposed secondary battery, battery layout that the British concluded as unworkable? Um, honestly, it was basically the ships they were trying to work through, and also <coughs> with the British, it's all about metacentric height. It's about keeping everything as low as possible. So they prefer to keep the batteries on one level. Plus, it makes aiming them easier and organize them. Um, Tim O'Neill. Um, yeah, there is often that myth that the shootings went public. There was no missus when prisoners went out for the grapevine. That never was the case. Uh, there was a reason for that, though. Uh, it's... It summed up best, I think, in the words of a Royal Marine Sergeant Major. And I know this quote because it's been... was passed down one of the branches of my family because they're all... they've quite a lot of them have been in the Royal Marines and various things. And... Uh, this guy was talking to the troops before D-Day. And he was being a typical Sergeant Major talking to the commando before D-Day and said you might have broadly speaking I'm gonna I'm, I'm, it's been passed down family tradition so please note if the lexicon's not quite right that's probably the reason why you might have ambitions of getting revenge we don't do revenge we're professionals just because the Germans have forgotten that doesn't mean we need to we do this properly we do this legally, we do this as we're supposed to be, as Royal Marines, and we don't forget who we are or what we are. And that's the thing. Uh, I, I would say again, that's the difference. It, once you start issuing orders and following orders like this, you very quickly forget who and what you are. And causing discipline to break down in any way, shape or form doesn't lead to a good end. And that's what this basically does. Thanks, Tim, for a day off. <coughs> It'll be good. Sorry. Didn't manage to get a hand in time. Uh, will you be going mackerel fishing in Cornwall when you get a kayak? Um, occasionally I do a bit of fishing from the, uh, from the kayak, but... Usually, I have to admit, I don't do fishing so much as I do um, underwater photography. And I have been known to go off for a pat to um, anchor my kayak, let's say, using a little bit of a, a weight, and do a little bit of um, snorkeling and stuff to get some pictures of fish and other things down there in Cornwall. Um, I quite enjoy kayaking around St. Michael's Bay if I get a chance. I've got friends who do a lot more kayak fishing than I do. It's not really what I tend to do when I'm out there, mainly because um, if I want to go fishing, I'll go on one of my cousin's fishing boats or one of my friend's fishing boats, not on my kayak. It's far more, fle uh, more, far more uh, flexible and you can catch better fish and you can have more food and there tends to be a fridge. So, you know, um, that's, you know, it keeps your iron brew cold. cold. <sighs> Contrast, what percentage of SPS missions do you think we even know about versus lost history? <laughs> I'd say I'd be, I think we're lucky if we got 1%. Um, were the vessels were US names originally American vessels? I think they were for American line, uh, American orientated lines. I'm not sure if they're American vessels. There's a debate about them, and it's been quite interesting to try and track down details, so I'm not going to get into that too much. Uh, I'm still looking up details on those. Mainly, uh, I would say it would have all been a lot easier if I hadn't been as unwell as I have been in the last few weeks, because I had this plan for a while, but I was planning on going and visiting some archives and sorting some things out, and also getting some more books. Because I've got two books and I have differing arguments over their names and their origins. Maximus, Maximus, 
What would the earlier advent of helicopters as opposed to the Nigerian Patriots tradition have done for the commander raids? Um, probably had them going further in the land. It would be interesting. Hey, Jordan, how long will New Year's Eve be? What a question about how close was the US and British, and US and British not allied, but getting closer relationship in the late 30s. So you talked about it yesterday, it'd be too long for it. Um, New Year's Eve will probably be about three to four hours. I'm planning to start at seven and go until about 11. Um, as for... As for that question, I would say put that into Patreon for, for February. Because that could be an entire Patreon discussion. My coach, how's your mom doing? Is she improving? She is getting better, but she's also, um, she's annoyed that it's taken so long and that it's been treated quite so quickly. Kayaks are barely boats. They're lovely. I believe I was referring to US troops in the bulge. Oh no, even in the bulge, uh, the 101st, um, they kept very strictly to their honour. Uh, you have. Uh, inter I had an interesting discussion with it, um, with a veteran a few years ago who sadly no longer with us, and who never gave permission to have his name mentioned there, and never actually wanted his Tories published. So, I'm not going to name him. But his view was very, very clear. That. If you sacrifice your honour, you sacrifice a lot of your unit. You sacrifice your morale. And therefore, you have to hold yourself to those standards. You have to hold yourself to the standards where you can look yourself in the mirror after war is over. And doing stuff like that, that's not you. That's not you. And I'd argue that when you have units doing stuff like that, that's a breakdown of control, a breakdown of command and control structure. And it's just... In World War II, it's one of the really interesting things that sets apart certain forces from other forces, is that they don't engage in that. A good example of a force which does lose certain control of that regard... To an extent, understandable, but also probably because of the way they set up their own command structure. Uh, is what happens with certain Soviet units. And before anyone starts saying this is just slagging off the Russians, no, the Russians admitted it, and the Russians had to bring in other units to control them. Um, the Russians had some units which had been pretty much broken by Stalingrad and were still fighting in the front lines once they got to Berlin. And some of those units... They collapsed. Uh, they lost some officers in the run-up to getting into Berlin. Some people who had actually managed to keep their ba uh, better instincts than the officers who were left were not the same quality as the officers who had been in previously in charge, and they didn't manage to control them. And, yeah. Things happened. Um... Uh, it's rare it's whole units... But they had to be control. They had to be controlled and tempered, and the Soviets had to do that. Uh, with the British and the Americans, they had individuals, but they tended to be brought in by their own units. They had individuals who tried, who went a bit, mm, but their own units would tend to deal with them because, again, it's a unit morale issue, and it's a stain on the whole unit. That's what coolers are. Yeah, but the trouble is, if I have a cooler and space for a, and a, and a poodle in the kayak with me, it just takes up so much space. Um, you need more than two books? Always the one of fishing. Uh, mm.
That's right. What was the USN thinking when it developed its superimposed secondary battery layout? That it could get more guns aboard, more DACA. And that that would also offer overlapping peer thing, uh, coverage. No, sir. Why did the Royal Navy take so long to get started on their World War era heavy cruiser project? Because they were building other things. That's it, literally. And deciding what cruisers they wanted. Plus, it's really hard to justify a heavy cruiser in World War One when you've got the sheer amount of battle cruisers you've got in the North Sea. The Germans are as concentrated as they are, and then you have the uh, sheer amount of light cruisers you have. Um, can I Maximus? Were there any other British special forces besides the commanders and SAS and World War II? Tons of them. There are tons. The Chindits. Long Range Desert Group, uh, there's the SBS, SAS Commandos, there are, there's MI-19, SOE, uh, there's so, so many different groups. Seriously, the British Force is almost lousy with them, with small detachments doing all sorts of interesting things. And that's why I say one of the founding groups of the SBS, because the SBS is, of course, a founding group of the SBS, but there's also a whole host of other groups which are folded into them. Covers, do you suspect that there were successful German black ops in both World Wars, which were still secret or lost documentation? Potentially, but I also think there's a problem with successful German black ops is that they often have... How do I put this politely? Okay, the Germans have an issue with them. Their basic issue starts off with the counterintelligence situation in Britain. Britain, in both World War One and World War Two, does a very successful operation on German intelligence, which belies Britain being disnight. One of the things, again, it's like Canada is this really nice nation who are really nice to people, and then you look at the fact that Basically, whatever they do in a war afterwards is written up as, this will now be from this point considered a war crime. You do not do this. You do not do this. What did the Canadians do? They did this, this, this. Okay, that's now war crime. That's now war crime. That's now war crime. It was legal when they did it. It's not legal now. Um, Britain is this really not... It has this projection of being a slightly foppish, uh, very kindly nation, you know, um, uh, a bit strange and a bit eccentric. But it turns out when it comes to counterintelligence, we tend to be fairly good. Now, yes, we had some issues in the Cold War with the Soviets and our own issues in terms of Cambridge, but honestly, the thing is, with that scenario, is that those were all homegrown. When you're sticking foreign agents into Britain, we tend to be quite good at spotting them. Uh, the homegrown agents we have slightly more difficulty with because they can tend to play the game slightly better and actually move around slightly easier. And in that, uh, it's one of the interesting things about Britain is that our uh, that our upper class nobility have a habit of producing people who are communist, for want of a better phrase. Um, it's sort of very, very socialist for a better, uh, for a um, probably more acceptable phrase to them. <sighs> They're fun. Not for Louis, and it does sound fun. Oh, about kayaking. What other places do you like to? Um, kayaking in Norway has always been is always up there. It's always fun. Um, Iceland would be quite cool to do. Uh, I had the Great Lakes, of course, and parts of um, Canada and America. Uh, I didn't manage to, but did want to do some kayaking while I was in Australia. Um, I like kayaking. It's it's where I go to relax. It allows me to get away from humans.
And most special forces operations are not black are not black ops. They are there are different operations. Uh, black ops are a certain grade of operation. Um, black ops are deniable operations, and that's when you get very interesting different pieces of kit. Uh, I think one of the trouble you have constantly these days is you have a lot of media obsession with the most black ops are a level of deniable operation, but they are one level of it, and they are not even... Yeah. Architect Toad Sengon, how would gas turbines being available in the RN30s affect the Sydney strategy? Do you mean the Singapore strategy, or the Sydney strategy we, we discussed on this channel? If we did Sydney rather than Singapore, um, it means that Australia probably gets into the invited in the program quite early on. I was just saying I'm not a native speaker. That does that also causes fun because people who learn their English, um, especially uh, largely from media presentations, the news. Uh, I I do love when you listen to the news. Everything's a black op. Everything's this. Everything's that. And you're going. It's not. It's not. And plus, they're always special with special forces and secret units. But they they forget there are a whole un there are units which are not secret but have se operate in secret. So there are units which are secret and the units which are operated in secret. <sighs> you were raised by disgruntled veterans. It's always true, Dan. Uh, Anil, there are a lot of those around, but I would say... Again, it's kind of it's kind of interesting in the battle in the battle of Bulge and all these things. These units, the units which hold hold their morale and do and behave. Yeah, deniable operations you don't hear about. Definitely not. Yes, the news does call every. Every ship with weapons, a battleship. Um, I I did laugh. There was a, I think it was only online, but there was an article which says Britain deploys battleship to deter South American, uh, South American nation, and it was a river class OPV. And I was going, no, nope, that's a modern sloop. That's not a battleship. That's a sloop. That's a sloop. There are also Cavalry Para Specials too. Uh, Broomvale Radar Station Operation being one very nice. Yeah, they did. The Paras got up to all sorts of fun things as well. Um, I would say, uh, that, uh, as I said recently in the War of 1812, in the um, USS Independence video about the War of 1812, the thing that always surprises me most is that the Americans realize that quite a lot of the population of Canada is made up of people who fled Amer who left America after the uh, the revolutionary war because they didn't want to be American and yet still think those people are going to open them with are going to welcome them with open arms when they invade Canada. You sit there and go these are people who literally left you because they didn't want to be part of your country and you think when you invade they're going to go yes we love you we want you to come here. What possessed you to think that? <laughs> hmm. 
No, oh, that there's a couple of generals who basically only do. Um, I think it's Windergate. Uh... No, Windergate didn't do Norway, but he did all sorts of things. And... Yeah. All sorts of things. Win Old Windergate is a really interesting officer to do a history of. There are, let's put it this way, there there are two ranks which are very interesting in the British Armed Forces: Major and Major General. And you can find all sorts of characters at Major General and Major. And then there is Carlton the Weird as well, who gets to the Sun Germ. Well, let's just let's just leave Carlton the Weird out of it, because Carlton the Weird is an entire category all of his own. <laughs> there is. These are some interesting people. These are some interesting people. Carlton the Weird. Okay. <laughs> just put in glass box. Break box in case of war. Oh yeah, both sides are. I can also talk about the British just as, uh, just as rudely as I talk about it's the, the whole thing about we're waiting twelve. Although I did laugh, someone the other uh, someone has literally come to go. There was a moral difference between supplying food to the French colonies and selling them food and clothing and selling weapons to uh, the natives. And I was sitting there going, well, A, they were also selling weapons to the colonies, so let's leave it to one side. And B, the whole reason the British were trapping them off was to try and starve them into submitting so you're literally aiding the enemy to stop them falling to siege yeah whereas the natives aren't actively at war with you at this time they're just you want to take their territory i don't think you want to get into the moral equivalency battle on the uh, debate on this particular topic it isn't a good one for for america Carlton is the what league is like, walking black knight. Yeah, well, honestly, no. And Carlton the Wit is one of the few people who actually makes the black knight meme look real. Were there any attempts to establish the money units before the war? This is one of the interesting things. Okay, uh, again. I am highly suspicious of the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines, but there is no, no smoking gun I've ever been able to find, so I cannot prove it. But I am highly suspicious, especially considering the British, the Royal Navy keeps the SBS going post World War II. They do not, uh, whereas the Army disbands the SAS, at no point do the SBS get disbanded. Yes. Unfortunately, the real losers in the War of 1812 were the, were the indigenous population and were actually the Spanish. It's one of the interesting things. It goes back, everyone else, it goes back to prior to the war status, but the natives have lost their Takumish, who was their, pretty much their best leader, and um, the Spanish are done for in Florida. Yeah, anyone trying to claim the US won the War of 1812? It's like, I wouldn't try and claim the British won the War of 1812. No one won the War of 1812. That's the whole point of going back to uh, status quo antebellum. You've all lost. At one point, Britain's controlling the whole of Maine. We've re-established the colony in charge of Maine. That's just... It's nuts. Um, the LRDG aren't really a thing on the Libyan border in 1939, but there are some interesting organizations going around. It's... Yeah.
Have I used up my own brew today? No, you have. Okay. First things first. I shall get out some raisins. Because I've been told by the doctor when I went to this morning I should have more fruit. So raisins it is. And I will have raisins with iron brew because iron brew must also have fruit in it. After all, it is orange in colour. <laughs> it is orange, fruit is orange, therefore it must have fruit in it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, literally too angry to die. Carlton the Weird. No, Carlton the Weird is not too angry to die. He's too stubborn to die. It's basically impossible to kill him. He just goes to you and goes, But I haven't done what I wanted to do yet. Okay. Can you just do it and die? Well, again, if we could talk about the War of 1812. The fact is, the British, at several points, were supplying their blockading forces by going into smaller harbours on the American coast and buying stuff. I've had a carton of raisins. That's fruit. Mmm. Good point, Paul. It could be carrots. It is orange. Mmm. In fact, I think it's carrots and oranges. So it's a bit of both a fruit and a vegetable. Counts for two and one. Please note, I'm a doctor of history, not science, uh, not in science or medicine. So therefore, it does do not consider this medical advice or health advice. Okay, I've had two bottles of wine. Wine is made from grapes, therefore I have had two of my five a day. <laughs> right, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. Uh, tomorrow's video will explain what Beatrix and Emma are. I hope you enjoy Beatrix and Emma. The Long Patrol for this video will be out on Monday. The Long Patrol on guns, on gunnery drone will be out on Wednesday and the long patrol which will be out on Tuesday is going to be the first of the carrier long patrols now honestly I'm starting off by looking at the things which were not carriers but I'll explain more tomorrow oh, well, I'll explain more on Sunday when I go through the, uh, the year Hey, John, health advice for a doctor of history. Don't become a junior academic history. No, don't. Let's put this way. I was having fun, and I have realized that... Well, I need to publish more books. I need to sell more books as well, but I need to publish more books. 
basically, I, I, I have decided that I need to do everything I can to be as independent completely and as self-functioning entity as, as possible, in which case I need to be technically self-employed. And the stuff I can do being self-employed is YouTube videos and write books, and that's what I can basically earn money from. And occasionally do tutoring and, you know, do um, guest lecturing and those sort of things. But, yeah. I've been saying this for a while now, but sitting there going over... I, I had a very enlightening chat with my accountant who basically went... This doesn't technically earn you as much money per hour as this, but in terms of quality of life and reliability of income, this seems to be a far better bet than that. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Hope you're well. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you, Steve Clark, Verdun. Thank you, Blackburn Maximus. Thank you, Ross Thank you, Algar. Thank you, Dress Funk. Thank you, Frank Balmel. Thank you, Night6831. Thank you, Runon. Thank you, Cosy Drowsiness. Thank you, Tim O'Neill. Thank you, Darius Rodowski. Thank you, Timo Locker. Thank you, Paul Emus. Thank you, Frank Balmel. Thank you, Malaga. Constra and thank you, Do 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 Do. Melo6040. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, I'm not sure if I said Colin, but if I haven't, then Colin Cameron. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Architect096. Thank you, Dave Harrison, for being here for the whole way through and chatting away. That's been fun. Uh, thank you, everyone who's been chatting away. It's always fun to chat with you all. Um, Drakenred, thank you. Michael Cooch, thank you. And let's see. Dick Richards, thank you. And Richard Stevens, thank you. And let's see. Did anyone else I'm missing? I probably am missing some. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you had a nice time. Hope you um, learned something interesting about Operation Frankton, and thank you for watching. Take care, and have a lovely evening. Toodles. Yada da dee. Take care, Duke of Patchington. Sorry you're dead. And DG40, thank you. And Mike Phillips, thank you. And I'll look forward to seeing you all Sunday. Take care.